Thank you everyone for joining us. This is the community writing session for the Miami Center. I would like to start by thanking uh, John Blake and the center at large and Miami University for inviting us to be part of this. Um, before I get started in kind of talking about what the, the session is about, I want to introduce the people in the room uh, who will be speaking with us today. Um, to my left here, Alice. Hi, I'm Alice Kurtz, a social worker with uh, this many years and over the experience and over the run, and uh, help co teach the community writing course for Miami and NKU with Chris Walker. Hi, my name is Janai Miller. I'm an alumni of NKU, and I took the Writing Center course and participated in the residency program. And I continue to be in the community doing this work. Hi, uh, I'm Eva Smith, a student at NKU, and I took uh, Professor Wilkie's course in community writing, um, which helped me gain an understanding of the community. So. Great, thank you. And so, yes, my name is again Chris Wilkie, and I team teach this course historically. Um, the course is called Community Writing, and other times we've called the course uh, Designing and Writing for Social Change. So, the course has morphed over the years to um, include different uh, frameworks. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, um, slide. Yeah. Um, uh, Back in probably about 2006, I actually started teaching a course on Over the Rhine in, in, on campus at NKU. And I came across uh, Tom Dutton in the center at that time. And soon I found myself teaching uh, here in the center. John or uh, Tom did a great job of inviting me down here. And initially it just involved myself along with my own students from NKU. Uh, jumps to about 2009, 2010, uh, Tom Dutton and I started team teaching the class and at that point we started involving both NKU students together with uh, the Miami students who were involved in the Miami residency program. And thinking about the, the framework of the course at that time, Tom and I really thought of the course as kind of a workshop for activism, right? So the idea would be that we would read about issues in the neighborhood, um, maybe have some scholarly texts on activism, but then use the course as a kind of a, a workshop space in order to develop activist projects. And so as a result of that, students were able to, to produce writings and compose and design artifacts that were designed to inspire social change. And this partnership between NKU and Miami uh, has been sustained you know, for over 15 years now. And I, for one, am extremely, extremely um, grateful for the opportunity to be part of this. And I know that NKU students who over the years have been part of it, their minds have been open and it's been a great thing for them also. Uh, next slide. Um, these are our presenters. Uh, as you can see, so there's some names on there that more names on there than there are people here in the room. And so just want to say a few words about uh, the, the schedule of the presentation. Um, after I speak, I'm gonna turn it over to Alice. And Alice again is a, a, a team teacher. She's taught the course with me numerous times, and so she'll have a lot to say about the course as an instructor. And then we'll turn it over to Janaya. Janaya uh, is, as she's already said, an NKU, former NKU student. And then we'll move on to, to Eva, um, who will be the final speaker uh, for this, this afternoon. Um, Todd, Taj Ross, who's on the screen there, she unfortunately is not able to be here today, so she won't be speaking. And same with June Alexander, hasn't been able to make it, um, unfortunately, uh, for this presentation. Now, the final two uh, people, Gabby uh, and Caitlin, are both uh, involved with Street Vibes. Street Vibes is a street newspaper or street paper here um, that I'm sure many of you know about. And they're not able to make it um, because they're actually out of town at the moment. Um, but both of them have been integral to our course in terms of um, sharing uh, resources with the students in terms of writings, and many students who have taken the course have actually been able to have their work published in that paper. It's a paper that's devoted to social justice and advocating on behalf of people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so it's been a central part of our course. And so what will happen is that towards the end of the presentation, after all of our speakers have done uh, done their speaking, uh, will come back to me, and I do have a PowerPoint that, that both Gabby and Caitlin put together that I can just maybe highlight for all of you so we can um, learn more about street lives and how it connects to our class. Next slide. 
this right here is uh, just an excerpt from uh, the syllabus. And, you know, the one thing I'll just want, just want to say about um, this description in this excerpt is this idea that the students are actually creating and composing, and designing texts and artifacts that are not simply to be submitted to a professor, but really are to be um, interpreted and read and made use of during the course of the semester and beyond. Right. And so the idea is that writing is a tool um, where students are able to actually see their work in real time have an impact on the community. And the idea behind community writing is really this idea of having people from different backgrounds come together and share their stories. And so that is a big part of our class. This right here is just a quote, a couple of quotes that I always like to share to kind of get at the theme um, or the value of, of writing in our course. I'm not going to read, you know, the entire quote of, of both of these people, but I'll just read a couple aspects of it. Uh, Bonnie Newmeyer, which I'm sure many of you know Bonnie, um, I call attention to the final um, sentence of her, her quote. She says, we have always said in our effort, the first step out of oppression is expression. And that's really the tagline of the people's movement, uh, particularly the Pe uh, Peasley Neighborhood Center, when it comes to writing and, and discourse and language and the power of, power of writing, discourse and language for the movement and the cause. And that, so that idea of expression is, is central to the idea of having voices heard. And so I always share this quote with, with my students very early on in the semester. And that second quote by Nanny Hinskin, uh, who was a longtime activist, said back in 1995, we want to see development, but we don't want to be pushed out. This again kind of frames the course as uh, focusing on issues that relate to affordable housing, issues related to gentrification um, and displacement and so forth. And this is really seen as a rallying cry for, for the people's movement in terms of its rhetoric, which is something that we look at through the course of the semester. This slide right here is really just a great picture of kind of the, um, what our course involves. A lot of times what we do is we have the students sit, sit down with community residents and everyone's working on telling their story and doing writing. And the thing I would like to call attention here is that we have um, one individual uh, in the center of the screen, in the center of the image, and that's Ron English. Ron English is a long-term resident uh, of, of Over the Rhine and everyone around him um, are students, right? And I would like to call attention to the kind of power dynamics here. What's going on here is, is Ron is really positioning, him, positioning him, himself as the mentor. So he is mentoring the students. He's the one who's being the mentor, as opposed to having the students, you know, help uh, the resident, uh, which, you know, reinforces certain kind of power dynamics that we're trying to avoid. And so, um, that's really the framing of how we approach community writing throughout the course of the semester. Okay. And I'm going to end my presentation uh, of sorts with um, some showcasing voices. Voices is a uh, street newspaper that began in like 1969 all the way up to about 19, 1982, 1983. And these were basically uh, periodical issues that came out and circulated within the community that really highlighted the issues that were important to the community. And so as you can see on the screen there, uh, there's the kind of mission statement uh, of, uh, of the paper itself. And one thing I will say is that it really was an effort to take local issues related to affordable housing, related to uh, ending homelessness and whatnot, and connecting those kind of local issues to broader social justice concerns and realities. And so if you go through um, uh, the paper itself, and I'll just give you a few, a few of the uh, images of what it's about, what you can see in these images is uh, things are talked about, welfare rights are talked about, prisoner rights are talked about, obviously affordable housing issues are talked about. Um, uh, there's actually uh, a section that dealt with creative writing, prisoners writing, you know, in terms of their own creative writing. And so this is uh, a publication that, again, was published sporadically, you know, throughout the 70s mostly, that we share with the students. And the students are engaging with these texts and learn the kind of the history of the neighborhood and the history of activism in this space uh, over the course of many decades. And this 
publication, Voices, really has acted as a precursor uh, to Street Vibes, which is what this publication is right here. And um, I'll also say, before I move on to, uh, to Alice, I do want to share a few of the print editions of what students have published throughout the years. These are zines um, that the students have created a lot of times in coordination with actual community residents. And this one's called a People's Friend. This is where the students themselves are working in collaboration with the, student, with the residents um, and presenting themselves as partners. This right here, Between the Lines, was a project we did with Rothenberg um, Preparatory Academy, which is uh, a school, mostly elementary school here in the neighborhood, um, where the students, NKU students and Miami students were able to work uh, together with uh, young, young kids ranging from first grade to eighth grade. That was done about 10 years ago. And uh, finally, here's another zine, which is kind of more of a protest zine. I don't know if you can see this with the picture here, um, but you have the unheard, uh, and, 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 the, and you can see that where that's coming from, the perspective of the unheard. And this right here is called the herd, that's H-E-R-D, the herd. And so there you get uh, kind of uh, critiques of the, the corporate development in the neighborhood and the herd of, of corporate money flooding the neighborhood through the gentrification. And so it was kind of a, a real satirical kind of zine that was really interesting. This was done about, about 12 or 13 years ago. So this is actually an older zine. So with that, I'll pass it on to Alice. Okay. I'm Alice Kurtz, a longtime social worker in Oberdine. And um, in the course of uh, helping mostly poor people in the community, I was during a time of great gentrification, I came to write a book called Econocide, Elimination of the Urban Poor, and was um, a little bit of rub in the community about it and was tapped by Tom Dutton to come and join in the writing program and work with, with, with this guy. And uh, we co-taught the community writing course. Um, as you will remember in the, in the um, course of things in Over the Rhine, Nanny Hinkston's comment was very helpful. We, we were pushing people out to gentrify the community and to privatize the community institutions. And so how to teach our writing students who were engaged in the community to express that specific to, to the place was the task. And we caught upon the, the um, writer's project from the, from the New Deal, the Public, the, uh, Public Works Administration, who hired writers and published a tour guide of every, mostly every city in the country, but one published by in Cincinnati, looked like that. It was published in 1943, written by the, writers who were hired in the WPA project by the city of Cincinnati and they did about 35 mini walking tours of the community, one of which tour, tour number eight was called, it wasn't called Over the Rhine, it was called the Central Parkway area. And the little map that was used looks exactly like the census maps, census map uh, sections from that today, which is just identical. So we took the tour guide. Um, most people were not aware that there were writers hired and architects hired by the WPA. We knew there were, were skilled laborers who built bridges and highways and redid our parks and, and that kind of thing. But there were writers who actually came to the community and wrote, wrote this tour guide. So we. We took the great interest in the tour number eight of the Central Parkway area, and the students went out about and into the community with the little entries for each, each of the places and um, became much more in, involved, engaged and involved in the community and then were able to write it down. Um, I think the slide is up there that shows that the initial product was about 100 pages. and. Um, Many of the students were in the architecture program, so it was really it was nicely done with maps and charts and, and graphs. And then the, all of the students were, were learning to write about their community engagement. Um, the um, reason for one of the reasons that they were able to get the get 
into it was these tours were called walking tours. And the reason they were walking tours was because it was in the depression. And as the, as the introduction says, that there was that people didn't have rubber for their tires and gasoline for their cars. So they made, they made these in small units of walking tours, which is, was really uh, significant. Um, they also used, in the, in the original in the WPA tour guide, they used um, a combination of personal and factual writing for it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Um, the students were able to compare the original, the WPA tour guide, with what they learned about the community. And they could document, they learned to document <coughs> and write about it things that were still there, obviously still there, uh, but things that were missing, and also some things that were overlooked. And adding that personal attention to that was, uh, was made an um, interesting document. For example, things that were not even a question in the original tour guide, the over there on community housing Spring Street project, where the people's movement took over a building that was going to be taken off the market for affordable housing, sat in, got arrested, and in the end, the city deeded the building to the growing community housing. Um, there, yeah, and other things that, that were important to document were the shooting of Timothy Thomas across the street here on 13th Street that brought the uh, collaborative agreement to, to place and put great emphasis on community police relations. Uh, the legacy of over the Rhine mothers buying the Peasley School, and um, that building wasn't even there. The building that they took over was not even even there when the 1937 tour guide was made, um, so it certainly wasn't mentioned. Um, also, the students picked up on the bankruptcy of Tom Denhart, where we lost 1,200 to 1,400 affordable housing units almost overnight, um, and. It was the prelude to the, to the upscale development and gentrification that is surrounding us now. Um, the Over the Rhine tour guide that we did began in the school year of 2017-18 and continued to always still could, could do it and would be easily accessible to pick up and, and further develop and write important things. Um, it, it is particularly valuable because of the engagement that um, students have with right here and now, with just walking distance and with access to those folks who are making making decisions about that. Um, I, in closing, I thought it would be fun to read one of the entries in the, the original tour guide about Washington Park. Uh, remember. Part of what our students observed was the elimination of the Washington Park Elementary School, the elimination of the basketball courts and the deep water swimming pools, in effort to um, to ensure that the poor people would have no would have no access to. It. In any case, the Washington Park um, entry from the original tour tour guide reads like this: Washington Park. Bounded by West 12th Grace and Elm Streets was a Presbyterian cemetery before it was acquired by the city in 1895. Nearly six acres in extent, the park has a ball diamond, two swimming pools, horseshoe pits, an old fashioned bandstand, and many trees on its grass portion. On warm sunny days in the park, benches are filled with people who loaf and invite their souls. Several Civil War cannons, a huge round boulder, and granite busts of Frederick Kicker, German born patriot, and Colonel Robert McCook are in the park. In the northeast corner is a totem pole of fearful aspect that was carved by Boy Scouts at Camp Edgar Freelander. The 30 foot creation formerly stood across the street in front of the Boy Scout headquarters, where it gave passing drunks a bad start. Well, the students have great uh, with that entry, and it, it speaks to the, the, being able to write and engage in the community, so you know that kind of thing goes on. So that's what the tour guide is. The table of contents are there on the screen, and the 100-page document 
John, if we can find it at some place. <laughs> yeah, okay. we, we have it in PDF. Yeah, that's it. Yes, thank you for that history. Um, again, my name is Janaya. Um, I took Dr. Wilkie's Writing for Social Change course in the fall of 2018, um, which is crazy how fast time flies because it really, when I realized housing was an area of interest of mine that I wanted to focus on, um, after reading Ta-Nehisi Coates, A Case for Recreations, I began to explore different courses and opportunities to think more deeply about housing. And so when I had saw that course, I decided to take it. I really didn't know like what to, what to expect of it. I just knew that once a week we were carpooling to a class downtown in Cincinnati. And so um, like him and Alice mentioned, uh, um, we really, the, um, worked with people experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity to write pieces um, and learn how to narrate from um, a non-academic institutional perspective, which I really enjoy because I, in general, think academic standards are too stringent for papers. Um, so I really like that aspect of it and the idea of being able to get published and be in community and work in community, it felt like something natural. And so I was able to get my first piece published in Street Vibes and it talked about the destruction um, of the poor and how um, you cannot just move people around like cattle and expect a disaster, you know, not to be able to occur. So from there, um, that was really kind of like the catapult that directed the final two years uh, um, or yeah, final two and a half years of my undergraduate experience. Um, and I began to um, I had several different internships in the community and more specifically that following year when I uh, participated in the Over the Rhine um, residency program, which is um, facilitated through the Miami Center. I was the first NKU to participate in that more in depth. And so um, that was a really interesting experience because for a portion of the semester, I was able to live down here um, and, on a, and just like navigate the neighborhood as well. Um, and so also I had an internship with the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition too. So what Alice had mentioned around the, like the people's tour, that was something that I was a part of um, helping Dr. Mark with, who's their education director, um, put on and, and push out, especially when it came to them gearing um, up for their housing. Now March, which during the March, I tried to collect different stories from people as to what made them um, come here and that was like a really impactful event at, in um, Cincinnati, I think, because it set the tone um, for how we think about housing or just like just policy discussions around housing um, beyond like tenant organizing, which is, um, you know, canvassing. So door to door knocking, building by building and getting people to organize in that way, but also um, bringing like I guess you could say like practitioner, like practitioners to policy or people with lived experience to policy and twofold. And so um, I continued on um, after the semester ended and I was able to um, host uh, in collaboration with Cincinnati Action for Housing Now, which is an umbrella organization under the Homeless Coalition, um, several community conversations that focused on um, individuals with lived experience uh, um, in tenant organizing and also different people um, of different fields that aren't necessarily traditionally engaged. So students, uh, um, social, uh, younger people, social work majors, and particularly black people to kind of um, inform a discussion um, holistically and to think more deeply about what does that mean for them because um, you know, for me, like my lived experience informs my work, but just because you're a housing advocate, that doesn't mean that's what that's what's informing your work, right? So it's interesting to see how often I feel like, at least speaking from the black community's perspective, 
um, people who do work in social change and, and social oriented type of action work is sometimes informed by their lived experience. Of course, we're not all the monolith, but that's what I noticed when um, I was talking to education majors or social majors. Um, and then just other nonprofits that weren't necessarily in the traditional people movements um, vicinity and what that looks like and met for them. And so um, along this time, I continued to do community writing and I actually had um, a fellowship with the Congressional Hunger Center that was remote due to COVID. And so one of the papers that I wrote um, was called Trust Black Women, the Intersection of Food and Housing in Pittsburgh, because my placement was there. And so um, again, really um, going back to the community center, I really, um, that, that really impacted me wanting to continue to do qualitative analysis, um, which is engaging with people, um, with engaging with people in the community to participate in whatever work or findings or deliverable you're trying to push out, which is not something that's often valued or done in the academy and hasn't been until the last several years. Um, and so this was different because it wasn't necessarily um, some of the some of the black women participating um, were experiencing, you know, some like housing insecurity or just maybe lived in low income housing. Um, but again, what was different is that they were um, they were all in leadership positions within the community, whether one may work in a mayor's office, they may lead a nonprofit or they're doing they, you know, their whole life kind of like um, Alice or Dr. Wilkie or somebody who's been kind of just doing more community work, managing like a community garden or something to come together like, okay, black women are most disproportionately um, impacted by housing insecurity um, for, for several reasons, which is a whole class within itself. So I won't get to that. And so um, through that, as practitioners or people in a remote in a, in, who are able to make some sort of decisions within the workplace, um, what does that look like when we're being intentional as Black women to coordinate um, across groups, which again is kind of like um, like the is community writing kind of type of style, community participatory um, research. Um, and so that was something that was really interesting, hearing what it meant to collaborate, um, especially across generations of people, which is often kind of left out. And I think the center does a good job with um, with um, bringing generations of people together, which I'm sure many of you know is a very difficult task to do, or at least to uh, see and feel people. So um, following that, um, I continued to write and got a blog um, published um, from the Center on Law and Social Policy that focused on housing equality and how 2020 really, how the civil unrest in 2020 and um, the global pandemic, like there was a lot of money, as you all know, being pushed out into racial equity initiatives, but I framed this piece out on funding housing initiatives and being very intentional and specific about it, um, especially these bigger companies who are complacent in the, the um, systemic issue that we're seeing today, um, which is really not often a narrative being po um, pushed, and that was class but, um, class at the time hadn't really pushed out a lot of housing articles, so it was a big deal to push that out. Um, and so um, that was a portion of that was also published in Street Vibes and then some of my works through Street Vibes. I've been able to work with the international street newspaper to bring locally what some of the things are happening on a global scale. So one of the more recent issues within the last year, because I worked as a community organizer with the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalition, um, was um, so I, I not only did tenant organizing, but I also did a lot of stuff around civic involvement and engagement and bringing people's voices to politics. And so this, so last summer we were able to found the People Power Committee, which I was able to lead in last fall, um, was the largest field of city council candidates in the city's history. Well, not the history for the past 30 years. Um, and so we decided to do a two night candidate forum. And this was something that was, uh, 
um, very intentionally designed with the community and framing out housing as a central voting issue. Because again, without the issue three ballot measure, which is what the community pushed the Greater Cincinnati Homeless Coalitions and partners like the Miami Center, um, the local elected officials would not be talking about housing in the way they're talking about it. It was one. It was um, a long-term community members talked about how it up until that election, um, they there was never like a policy platform. Like both mayoral candidates, almost every council candidate had something about housing in um, in their in their platforms, and so we wanted to continue this movement. So again, um, making sure the narrative is centered on the people. So housing is a central um, voting issue, which is an article I wrote based on um, based on that experience. And so with that, this came out of it. So this was Cincinnati's first housing justice voter empowerment guide, which the questions were designed by the community. Um, and then we had community members ask the questions at the forum versus a traditional moderator um, doing that. So 12 different people from the community were able to ask that. So I said a lot of different stuff, but I wanted you all to have a better picture of the full scope of what community writing means. It's not just, you know, yes, you can write a book like Alice with the Connacide or, or do a zine, but there's also community organizing, community participatory work that can be done to push out these narratives. And so that's the work that I've done and I continue to do. And this guy can also be found on Cincinnati Action for Housing Now website and you can see full candidate answers. Thank you. So as I said, um, I'm, I uh, took prof um, Dr. Wilkie's course, and as part of the course, uh, he showed examples of zines that other students have created. Um, we created a zine ourselves. Michaela and Mia, who were other students, uh, worked with, we kind of worked in a group to create this um, timeline of street vibes and voices and the activism that went on. Um, that helped kind of form the people's movement today. And it goes from the 1960s, which is kind of like the beginning of the um, people's movement to now. And um, researching this timeline really gave me an appreciation for the legacy of the neighborhood and like the importance of like preserving this history of like persistence and like, you know, how people have helped rebuild the community and like um, to kind of what it is today and also talking about why it's important to fight against gentrification because it kind of like um, threatens this history. Um, and as Professor Wilkie mentioned in the beginning, we also work with the Miami students who are part of the residency program, um, who also helped give us uh, a window into the community as um, many of us had were from the Kentucky area, so we had not like actually lived in the community. And um, with the Miami students, we also um, worked with storefronts as well to sort of brainstorm ideas for an installation in Imagination Alley, which had just come up. And um, a lot of people in the community had some issues with stuff that was not a part of Imagination Alley. And working with storefronts, we hoped to make something that would be um, a result of the community. And um, yeah, overall, um, taking this course really helped me understand like the importance of activism and like the importance of affordable housing and why, you know, it's important to combat gentrification and how people should always have a voice in the creation of their community. So. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, both Gabby and Caitlin, who are our Street Vibes uh, folks, uh, aren't able to make it here today, but they did put together this, uh, this PowerPoint, which I'll kind of take us through and describe. Uh, before I do that, I do want to mention that if you have any questions uh, for the panel, for me or anyone else on the panel, anything that you heard that struck you for any reason whatsoever that you want to either comment on or ask a question for us, please feel free to, to ask the questions on your screen. Um, so yeah, so this is Street Vibes, uh, the panel, uh, I'm sorry, the slide. As I mentioned earlier, or showed you earlier, this is what the paper looks like. Uh, this is both Gabby and Caitlin right here. 
Uh, Gabriella, we call her Gabby, uh, is the editor in chief of Street Vibes. Um, she's been, I believe, uh, with Street Vibes, she's been editor, I think, since 2018. Um, she's been wonderful, um, very active in the community, and a, a great resource for our students in this class. Uh, Caitlin is now Dr. Caitlin. Uh, she just is going to be graduating uh, this semester. She just finished her dissertation um, at UC, at University of Cincinnati English uh, PhD uh, that she just earned. And part of her dissertation was focusing on uh, taking Street Vibes, the publication, and turning it into an archive, um, a digital archive. And so there's an actual digital archive now that um, houses not all issues of Street Vibes over the last you know, 25 years, but most of them. Um, Street Vibes as a publication began in 1997. And um, this slide right here is just basically calling you know, the question of what, is this, what are street, street papers? And I'm not going to you know, go into all the detail of what street papers are, but um, essentially what we call street, vapor, street papers are part of the international network of street papers, which is strongly connected to issues of homelessness. So a lot of these papers um, are in different cities, not only throughout the country, but also internationally. And many of those uh, publications are designed actually to um, subsidize and assist um, financially people experiencing homelessness. So for instance, here at um, in Cincinnati, Street Vibes is actually sold on the street by people who are experiencing homelessness or formerly experienced homelessness, and it acts as a source of income um, for those individuals. And the writings uh, that are actually produced in Street Vibes, it's a really good mix of the news, um, as you might understand it, uh, alongside the voices of people in the community, right? Um, and so there's different genres of writings. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, um, students from my class, or our class, I should say, uh, get to, you know, a lot, a lot of semesters, they get to actually publish their work, you know, in the paper itself. Um, this is describing, you know, or calling attention to how it works, um, which I guess I just did in terms of being able to um, distribute the paper on the streets. It's a primarily a print paper, right? There is a, a, a web page that you know will post a few articles here and there, but the full um, publication is actually a street publication or a, a print publication, and I think that's really important um, because you know with changes in technology and, and whatnot, you know, we not uh, having print editions of different publications I, I think is still really important, particularly for the populations um, of those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, this right here is collaboration is the key. And so um, here's where I'll say a few things about the relationship between Street Vibes and our course. Um, when Gabby jumped on board in 2018, she, I, you know, I basically asked if she would like to introduce Street Vibes to our students, right? And she had the idea of actually having the students published in the paper itself. And so what we started doing is we actually start having writing groups where we have people who are in the course. These are college students, both Miami students and NKU students, uh, working with on writing with people who are experiencing homelessness. And the idea was to help each other or assist each other in writing stuff that could get published in the paper. Um, so that kind of jump started the whole idea of writing groups for the course. And since then, since 2018, Gabby has actually come to our class on a regular basis and work closely with the students in the course to actually write stuff on their own and maybe in collaboration with people in this um, people experiencing homelessness to get stuff published in the paper. And I think Janaya, um, you know, did mention that she's had work published. <laughs> she definitely has uh, from this class. So um, next slide. Uh, so this right here is just the idea of the kind of social justice theme of the paper. The paper isn't strictly or only about homelessness. It, really uh, goes the entire span of social justice issues. So issues of diversity and inclusion are really important. Um, and so that's the end of the slide <laughs> show that they put together. Uh, both Caitlin and Gabby very much wanted to be here. I believe Gabby, as we speak, is getting on an airplane to Mexico, uh, where she's from. I mean, her family is from Mexico. Um, and so she's gonna be seeing, seeing family in Mexico over the weekend. And you know, Caitlin wasn't able to make it here also, but they both very much wanted to be part of this uh, panel presentation. 
So, so with that, I think we're, we're actually towards the end of our presentation, but if there are any questions that were submitted, I don't know if there were, but there wasn't. Okay, so. Can I have one? Yeah, one go one ahead. One. And, yeah. We've referenced the fact that I wrote this book called The Concide Elimination of the Urban Poor. And writing the experience of this, of this community, we had a upscale academic review of Tom Dutton published by here. And at the same time, it was read by a community resident, a man who grew up in Over the Rhine, was in the elementary school in the first grade when the elementary schools were integrated after the Brown versus Board of Education. He is longtime family here, Sonny from Context City. He came to some event here and caught on to the review that Tom Button had done and went to the library and got my book. And every time here he said to me, well, you know, I really like that book. He said, I like that. I'd like to send that to my friend who's in jail in Texas. So I gave him a book. And in due course, he wrote, wrote back to me. He has some learning problems and doesn't do cursive writing, and it was before computers. And he hand wrote this printed note that says, dear friend, I've lived in OTR since birth and have went through evictions and displacement of my family, including my grandmother. I want to thank you for this important gift of the work to the working class, Sonny Grassroots Investor. Those two reviews just tell the story of what, what we do in this academic setting in the hood. And uh, if you want to, you certainly want to commend uh, Tom Dutton for starting it, but John for being, being able to continue it, and the rest of the Miami group keeps alive and well. Another thing that I do want to add is as of this past August, um, I've been living in Over the Rhine, so yeah, so um, yeah, I rent an apartment here, and I just wanted to bring that up about like specifically the impact of the program. And um, I'm finishing my master's program this semester, Master of Public Administration and Social Justice. And my capstone, um, my capstone project was called "We Ain't Giving Up: City Heights Tenants Rise Up and Fight Back." So that incorporated a lot of community perspectives um, from residents in this housing complex in Covington, and it was like 47 pages. So yeah. Well, in closing, I'll just say a few things. I, um, the theme of the class, this particular course, one of the big themes is asking students to make connections between their lived experiences writing but writing in multiple forms and the way we generally set up the, the course content and frame it is this idea of what we call academic writing or school-based writing and learning uh in contrast with writing in the community right but those are different ways of uh, encountering and in, in, in experiencing language and discourse. And they have deep consequences for building human relationships, right? So the idea of writing and the participation of writing itself becomes a strategy in essence for building more just, equitable, and um, enduring sustainable relationships across difference. Uh, and one of the things that Tom Dutton would always talk about, if I could bring Tom Dutton into the room, is, is the idea of seeing the center as a place for building empathy across difference, meaning that you have people from different backgrounds. Obviously, you have students who are coming from different places, um, coming in to encounter you know, people in the neighborhood. And so um, all stakeholders involved, whether that's students, professors, or uh, students, that, you know, um, community residents, everyone has a stake in what's going on. And it's through that kind of fostering um, language and discourse through the, the presentation of actual readings and, and assigned writings uh, for the students themselves, that becomes a way to not only increase and become better writers, but it, it actually becomes a strategy for becoming better citizens, better uh, people <laughs> who, who are committed to a more just and equitable society. And so I would like to end the presentation by honoring Tom 
Um, and it really was, I think, Tom's idea discourse um, where he just kind of sat me down one time and said, you know what, why don't we have the Miami students or the NKU students and make it a course in activism. That was his, his idea. And that's what we ended up doing, you know, and the course has, you know, has many different manifestations over the years. Um, and so I just like to return back to, to the center itself and just, you know, thank the center for, for uh, working with myself and NKU students. And I think it's been a great relationship. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>